Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Brice Lefrancois. I'm a scientist at DNA Genotech, and today I'm going to be talking about optimized skin collection, extraction, and sequencing. So there's many challenges when doing like human microbiome skin sampling and analysis. And the first one is when looking at the human skin, there is a wide diversity of collection sites. And each of these sites tend to support different microbial uh, communities. And skin can be divided into three main types of uh, sites. So there's sebaceous or oily skin. So a typical example would be the face, scalp, or the chest. Then there are wet or moist skin. And prime examples are like toe web or any body fold. And then there's dry skin. So that would be the hand, the arm, or the legs. In general, skin is very low in nutrients. And as such, it has a very low relative microbial abundance. And we're talking about anywhere between 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 9 bacterial cells per square centimeter. So dry skin is on the low end of that range, so 10 to the 3 or so, whereas sebaceous skin tend to be on the higher range, so 10 to the 9. And uh, environmental contaminant and bio burden can be significantly used in skin microbiome sampling. So any DNA that comes from the collection process, the collection kit or the extraction kit can cause like, mm, major issues in like downstream application. And to these days, there's a lack of standardized mean to collect skin microbiome samples. So there's two ways of collecting the skin microbiome. One of them is using a swab where you rub the skin surface of interest. And some people argue that swabs are not, uh, are not perfect because they can only uh, capture the surface skin microbiome. The alternative to swabbing is tape stripping. So in that case, you use a sticky tape and that tape can be applied to the skin region of interest. And that way you can like, capture the like, deeper uh, parts of the skin microbiome. But one of the big problems with uh, tapes is that extraction and recovery of the bacteria that are captured can be a real challenge. So we decided to leverage the, um, uh, our knowledge of DNA Genotech and we developed Omnigen Skin, which is a swab based skin collection uh, device. So you see that it's very simple. It consists of a swab, flood swab with a breaking point an omni-gene collection tube, so that contains one mil of uh, stabilization solution, as well as a weighting agent. And here on the right side of my screen, you can see the IFUs that are provided with each of the sites. And we spent quite a bit of time working on them because to like, get good quality skin samples, you really need the end user to like, collect uh, uh, as well as possible. So it's like very simple. We tell the, uh, the user to like remove the swab from the little pouch, then dip it into the uh, wetting solution. And then we're asking uh, the user to like, collect for a total of 60 seconds while applying pressure for the, from the region of interest. And I, I think that application of pressure is really uh, paramount to make sure that you're going to be picking up as many of the bacterial cells as possible. And we also recommend that uh, user collect from 40 square centimeter or so to like, get good bacterial recovery. So one of the things we realized very early on in this project is that optimal processing of skin sample is paramount. And for optimal yields and results, really, you need to like process the entire Omnigen skin sample in a single extraction. And we early on, we tested that commercially available kit, but the problem is that they usually don't really accommodate uh, one mil input volume. So we had to be creative and basically start doing feedback concentration of the sample to like lower the overall volume or like modify the protocol to like accommodate for like larger input volume. And none of these approach were like really ideal. So we ended up developing our own workflow. So it's an optimized processing uh, workflow that's like specifically designed for Omnigene skin sample. And in essence, it's very simple. So it's a bead beating based uh, extraction protocols, so bead beating ensures that you're going to get good recovery of both gram positive and gram negative bacteria. And we've really optimized the DNA recovery step uh, for low biomass samples, so we really want to make sure that we can get as much of the DNA as possible out of those kits. And also, it allows for like rapid processing of Omnigene skin sample in a single extraction, and there's no pro protocol modification that are required. And just to show you some data that we got, so we got about eight donors to collect from various sites. And here I'm comparing the yield that we're getting with a commercial kit where we did the speed by pre-concentration of the sample versus our optimized low biomass workflow. And you see that we're getting like pretty high 
the quantities of DNA out using like our optimized workflow as well as a commercial kit. And we're talking about about 150 to 200 nanogram per sample for like face and scalp. Forearm are much lower, but that's expected because this is dry skin where relative bacterial loads are uh, lowest. And then for axilla and toe web, wet site, you see that it's highly site and donor dependent. And here are environmental controls. So those are uncollected kits. And that shows that there's very, very little contaminating DNA uh, that's present in our kit, which is good because uh, skin being so low biomass, you wanna make sure that bio burden is as low as possible. And just to give you an idea of like how the workflow has an impact on the quality of the sample. So here I'm showing you if you use a standard workflow, so an extraction where you only use like a 200 or 250 microliter input, and you process skin samples collected in omnigene skin, you're able to recover about 10 to the 4 16 s copy per microliter of elution. And that's like several order of magnitude below what you get from medium biomass uh, microbiome site, so such as tongue or vaginal samples, and like much lower than stool where like biomass is highest. But by implementing our optimized workflow, you see that we were able to get to a one to two log increase in recovery from like all the sites that we tested and we basically were able to bridge the gap that there is between low biomass and medium biomass. And we're, we're estimating that the total recovery based on our calculation is around like 40 to like 50% of all the bacterial DNA that's present on the skin surface. And the main advantage of that low biomass workflow is that really you're gonna get increased consistency, fewer sample dropouts, so better yield meaning that you're gonna get better results down the, down the road, but you can also perform multiple assay and include replication in your downstream uh, application, which is the like, key for low biomass. And just to show you the overall extraction performance of our workflow, so um, ATCC intact cell mock uh, communities, so MSA 2005 were extracted with our workflow and you see that we're able to recover all six species and we're like recovering at a relative abundance that's in line with what's in the DNA mark. So we're able to dice both gram positive and gram negative bacteria. So then we wanted to make sure that Omnigene skin can capture the site specific bacterial and fungal profile. So we had four donors collecting from four different sites. So that includes Sebastian's wet and dry. And then we extracted the DNA with our optimized workflow and perform like amplicon sequencing. So both 16S using V3, V4 primers and ITS2. And as you can see, we did see a robust amplification for both 16S and ITS per face and the web sample. Like less amplification for 16S for forearm samples, but again, that's something that we expect because there's like very, very little uh, bacterial load on that site. And the environmental control were like put through the uh, amplification as well. And as you can see, we got very, very little to no amplification. And that's again, like indicative of low bio burden overall. And you see that the uh, samples that were collected give like much higher uh, library yield. And then if you look at the 16S taxonomic profile, so this is V3, V4, you see that forearm, face and scalp samples tend to be dominated by clean uh, bacterium. So this is expected and this is what's been published in the literature. Two web samples have a different uh, community structure. It's mainly dominated by two species, Corinibacterium and Staphylococcus. And again, that's something that's been shown in the literature. Uh, looking at ITS2 sequencing profile, like one of the main skin uh, fungal species or genera, genus that we were able to pick up is Malasasia. So this is like one of the most abundant skin commensal, except for toe web sample where we see a greater diversity of like fungal uh, genera. But again, this is in line with the literature. And I think what's, uh, what's exciting is that Omnigene skin really captures a site specific uh, profile, both bacterial and fungal. So switching gear a little bit, I'm gonna be talking about the validation that we did for Omnigene skin. And as I mentioned in my introduction, skin has very low microbial loads. So you cannot, technically um, the sample the same site twice. And since you want to like, process the entire sample in a single extraction for optimal yield, we had to be a little creative. So what we opted to do is collect paired samples. So the left and the right side of the face, and we use those paired samples uh, to assess like profile stability and neutrality. So what we did is one of the sample was extracted at baseline while the other one was extracted post-challenge and challenge was either simulated chipping 
or uh, extended storage at room temperature. So biological variability had to be assessed because we're collecting from the left and the right side of the face. And we needed to make sure that we were gonna be assessing how much variability there is between the two sides of uh, the same person uh, face. And here, so we generated 16S bacterial profile using like V3, V4 primers. We have 20 donors per condition. And as you can see, when you look at the biological variability at baseline on the Hutchinson scales, which is like measuring like the dissimilarity between the sample, you see that it's very low. But what's exciting is I think we were able to show that by like doing extended storage of room temperature, so 30 days, or like multiple freeze cell cycles or incubation at elevated temperature, we didn't see an increase in the biological variability, which means that the profiles were stable in our kit. And as a reference, we also measure the donor to donor uh, differences in the profile. And you see that this is much higher than it was for the biological variability. So the same donor, it's about 30 units on the HSN scale. And that really that goes on to show that we're capturing the uniqueness of each uh, donor's profile. We also looked at the stability of fungal taxa and we chose not to use the ATS for two because there was too much variability. And we ended up using like spiking experiments. So Malasasia globosa for this. And I'm not gonna be talking about that data, but anybody interested can go on the DNA Genotech website and look at our white paper. So just to show you the overall profile stability. So again, this is from the validation data and we see 16S taxonomic profile that were generated from face samples using V1, V3 at the genus level. So again, you see that the paired samples, so one extracted at baseline versus the one extracted after storage for 30 days at room temperature, you see that overall the profiles are maintained. There are small differences, but keep in mind that those are and you clearly see that each donor has a unique profile that's like captured and stabilized in omnigene skin. Same thing with harsh conditions, so incubation for like three days at 37 degrees. Again, you see that we're capturing the uniqueness of each uh, donor's profile, but those profiles are also stable over time, even when incubated uh, at a high temperature. So there's no growth of any uh, bacterial taxa uh, under those conditions. We also wanted to, uh, to assess the performance of Omnigene Skin versus some of our competitors. So again, we used like paired samples correction uh, to do that. So face and form, so higher biomass versus lower biomass site. And we targeted eight donors. We had two cohorts. The first one was comparing Omnigene Skin versus competitor C, and the second one Omnigene Skin versus competitor N. And we didn't use our optimized workflow for this comparison. We wanted like a fair comparison of the collection process. So in both cases, we used like similar input into the extraction and we used uh, the kit that were compatible with each of our competitor device. And if you look at the DNA yield that we got from that experiment, so you see that the Omnigene skin in both cases was able to recover two to three, two to three times more DNA from both the cheek and the forearm samples. So you clearly see that. Uh, and I think the, uh, the increase in yield was like really striking for forearm samples. So dry skin where relative abundance is very low. So you see that for the samples collected in competitor C or competitor N, there is a significant proportion of the samples that show like DNA that's not significantly uh, different from the environmental control. So that means that basically those you could be looking at background, whereas with only gene skin sample, you see that we're capturing more DNA and we're capturing also the diversity uh, of the donors in terms of yields. So since total DNA capture doesn't really mean that you're necessarily getting more bacterial DNA, we also looked at bacterial DNA recovery and we did that on those cheek samples and we measured the average 16S copy number in the extraction. And as you can see, Omnigene Skin was able to recover 1.6 and 10 to the 5 16S copy per microliter. And that's significant higher than competitor C or competitor Z or competitor N, which are anywhere between 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4. And again, I think it's important to point out that this is not even using our optimized workflow. So with our optimized workflow, you could achieve up to like 10 to the 6 copies uh, per microliter. Then we took the sample through 16S sequencing. And as you can see, those are the final library yield. So one thing is 
Yeah, that's pretty obvious is that we got pretty good amplification for cheek samples for our omnigene skin and the competitor. But what's interesting is that you see like uh, on, uh, on average, like average, uh, the yields for Zodibri are much higher and more consistent with omnigene skin than they are for our competitors. But again, looking at forearm samples, which are like very, very low biomass, you see that again, there's a couple of samples that end up being undistinguishable from the environmental control. So those uncollected kit, and that's basically telling that there was hardly any material that could be amplifying those reactions. And that's not the case for like uh, forearm samples collected in omnigene skin. We see that we're saying like more robust amplification, which means that we had material that, that was coming from the, the, the skin sample itself. So we also wanted to like really get a better understanding of the performance of omnigene skin and try to like assess like the minimum number of cells it was going to be able to collect and detect. And for that, we designed like a, an experiment using artificial skin. So we grew bacteria and we spiked a known amount of bacteria on a 2.5 inch by 2.5 inch uh, artificial skin surface. We let those bacteria dry and then it was collected with omnigene skin. And 2.5 by 2.5 inch is about 40 square centimeter. So this is with our the current recommendation as far as, uh, as surface area to collect from. Then we, the DNA was extracted with our optimized workflow and we assessed recovery of uh, Francisella filamorigia, our spike bacteria by qPCR. And you see that we were able to show that we get very good average recovery. So we're talking about 40% across multiple dog, and we were able to detect as low as 10 to the four uh, bacterial cells spread on that 40 centimeter uh, square surface. So overall, our data indicate that Omnigene skin collects two to three times more DNA than the other swab-based device. And that improved performance, I think, is critical for lower biomass skin sites, such as dry skin. So you're getting better bacterial uh, DNA recovery, but that also ensures that you're not going to get as many uh, dropouts. And I think that's also better uh, capture of the skin microbiome also helps ensure that you're going to be able to overcome the bio burden. Uh, our like, optimized workflow is recovering around 40% of like, the total bacterial load in a sample across multiple log. And uh, what's exciting too is that we were to, able to detect as little as 10 to the four cells spread on that artificial skin. So that's very few uh, number of cells. So we, we uh, recently started a collaboration with Dr. Jean Maggie at Harvard University, and she's interested at looking at differences in like, the community profile between acne and LC individual. So she's been using our Omnigene skin device to collect from LC and uh, acne patient. And we extracted the samples that she collected with our optimized workflow. And you see what's very exciting is that we're like seeing uh, very good yields for most of them. So on average, we're recovering about 75 uh, nanogram of DNA from uh, those kits. And here you can see that this is the WGS threshold. So all the samples that are above that line uh, qualify for like amplification and library prep in uh, shotgun sequencing. And as you can see, 90% of the samples were higher than this. And why am I pointing this out? I think I'm pointing this out because if you're interested in the acne, you really want to go after like strain level identification. And in table on the right side of my screen, I'm just presenting overall Omnigene skin NGS performance metrics. So you can see that we're getting like very consistent uh, success rate with amplicon sequencing applications. So it's both 16S and ITS. 100% of the samples that we put through that pipeline amplified well and well above the environmental control. When you look at WGS success rate, so for higher biomass sites such as face and scalp, both the batches, we're seeing like the vast majority of the sample that pass. Two web samples are a different story. It's very donor dependent, but we're seeing good results nonetheless, with like almost like 50% of the sample passing. And again, what's exciting is that with the clinical sample collection, so that acne cohort, we saw like 90% of the samples that would qualify for shotgun sequencing. So we did some shotgun sequencing, and just to give you an idea, we're 
uh, we looked at the overall and the average bacterial DNA content. So the problem with shotgun and skin is that there's a lot of host material. But as you can see, we're getting like a significant proportion of the DNA that's bacterial in origin. So for face and scalp, we're talking anywhere between 30 and 40%. And like toe web, uh, surprisingly, are almost uh, exclusively bacterial DNA. We're talking about 96%. And here is just a range, so it's very donor dependent, but it's anywhere between like eight and 63% for uh, sebaceous skin sites. And just to show you some of the shotgun data that we've uh, generated. So here you can see like face, scalp, and toe web samples that were put through like booster shot at our sister company, Diversogen. And as you can see, we are like seeing similar profile as what we had seen with 16S amplicon sequencing. So you see that sebaceous skin site, face and scalp are dominated by QD bacterium. That's expected. However, what's interesting is that you're seeing like much higher relative abundance of QD bacterium uh, in shotgun data than we were in the amplicon sequencing. And I think this is tied to the fact that there's no PCR bias uh, in that case. So I think shotgun data gives you like a better representation of the true relative abundance of bacteria on the skin. Toeb uh, samples are very different again. So we again see that they're dominated by two main uh, genera, and that's gonna be Corinne bacterium in green as well as Staphylococcus in, in red. And since we uh, generated shotgun data, we were like really interested in looking at C-ACNIS strain level identification. And we were able to like, um, identify up to 20 unique C-ACNIS strains in like phase samples. And we organize those unique strains by ribotypes. So strains that share the same ribotype are usually related to one another because they share like the same 16S sequences. And as you can see, so those were LC donor, we were able to show that most of the donors were dominated by ribotype one, two, and three, uh, which are the main three uh, ribotype found in skin. But we were also uh, able to detect ribotype four and five at very low relative abundance. And those ribotypes are known to be enriched in acne. Here I'm just showing compositional uh, PCA plot of the shotgun data presented on the left side. And as you can see, what's interesting is that we're starting to see each of the individual site uh, clustering. So we're able to like really see differences between each of the sites. So toe web samples tend to cluster on the right uh, side of that graph, whereas face and scalp, which are both the batches, there is some overlap, but we are starting to see uh, resolution between those two different sites, which is exciting. So I think one of the advantages of shotgun is that you're, you're, there's no PCR bias and you're able to like really do strain level resolution, but also improve resolution of the site specific microbial profile as shown on that PCA plot. So I hope like all the data that I've shown you today is that Omnigene skin has been validated and it's been validated for the major type site that are found on the human body. So that's going to be sebaceous, wet, and dry skin. Overall, our data indicate that the bio burden in our kit is low. And that's like something that's key to, uh, to good performance in downstream assay, especially in, for anybody that's interested in sampling dry skin, where relative microbial abundance is very low. Uh, we have data that clearly shows that omnigen skin can capture and stabilize the human skin microbiome both bacterial and fungal during transport at ambient temperature, but also during storage for 30 days at room temperature. Our data also indicate that Omnigen skin outperforms all the other swab-based collection devices that we've tested. So we're seeing improved yields, uh, total DNA, but we're also uh, seeing like improved bacterial DNA recovery. And I think ultimately that translates to that greater sensitivity uh, in like downstream assays. And one thing that I think is key is that we've been able to like develop like an optimized workflow to maximize DNA yield. And I think this is really key for low biomass samples because you want to ensure as much success as possible in downstream NGS application. And that workflow uh, is like really showing us great success rate in like amplicon sequencing. So we're talking about 100% for all the sites that we've tested for both 16S and ITS. But we were also, like I didn't show that data, we were also able to show a compatibility with LoopSeq and like full and 16S uh, sequencing. So for anybody interested, we have like a manual low biomass extraction that's currently available 
uh, as a prototype, but we're also looking at co-developing a plate-based high-throughput workflow in collaboration with our sister uh, company, Diversigen. And I think that workflow also enables to like achieve yields that are high enough for like shotgun sequencing for select higher biomass skin site. And I think that's something that's very interesting for anybody that's interested in like, you know, taking a closer look at community structure uh, differences, but also strain level identification. And that concludes my talk. Thank you very much for your attention.